Thank you, Ashley and Kristen, and welcome to KGW News at 5 o'clock on this glorious spring Thursday. It's good to have you along with us. And as we go through this pandemic, it can be reassuring to know we are all in this together. Even some of our iconic statues. My daughter Meg snapped this photo on her run yesterday. Our first president, George Washington, leading the way wearing a patriotic mask. This is the statue at Northeast 57th and Sandy, right outside the German American Society. It was erected there in 1926. A Rose City Park fourth grader, Nolan Kearsley, made the mask at home on the family sewing machine. Way to go, Nolan, and thank you for reminding us we are indeed all in this together. And with George Washington on our side, we got this. Thank you for your vigilance in keeping the distance, staying home, and staying safe. We may have to do this for a little while longer, but we can do it together. And if you see inspiring pictures around your neighborhood, post a photo. Use the hashtag KGW together. Now let's get you caught up on the latest news today, Thursday, April 16th. We're always hearing about the constantly changing numbers of people who have died from the coronavirus, but there are real people behind those numbers. And tonight, for the first time, we're hearing from the family of a 70 year old man who was the first confirmed COVID-19 patient to die in Oregon. Christine Pitawanich spoke to his family. At his heart, he was just a good wholehearted person who wanted to help everybody. Lynn Bryan's family is coping with a big loss. They say he died from COVID-19 on March 14th. You know, he was, he was just always full of laughter. Oregon state health officials aren't releasing the names of people who died from COVID-19, just their ages and where they died. We spoke with Brian's nephew, brother, and sister-in-law. They say he was diagnosed with the coronavirus at the Portland Veterans Affairs Medical Center, where things escalated fast. They never got to say goodbye. The hardest thing for all of us was not ever being able to see him again and to say I love you to him. and to talk to him. He was playing cards and came home and wasn't feeling good. He'd already been moved to the ICU and was on a ventilator. And so because of that, with the tube down his throat, they had to put him in a medically induced coma. They say his heart and other health problems made the situation worse. And in just one week, Brian was gone. So it's, it's a huge hole in our hearts. But Brian's life was a memorable one, filled with joy. He, he loved dance. Uh, that was one of his biggest loves. He was a big proponent of just dance. Brian was a constant in Portland's country western dance scene. I always wore a cowboy hat when he was around the horses and dancing. Before. Lynn's love of dance, his first passion and love was horses. It was a life well spent. Just a glowing bright light of fun and joy. A life well loved. He's just my brother, you know, we're gonna miss him. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. And our deepest sympathies to Lynn Bryan's family. Here's a look at the latest case numbers. The Oregon Health Authority is reporting six new deaths from COVID-19 today, bringing the state total to 64. Confirmed cases rose to 1,736. So far, more than 34,000 people have been tested. Washington health officials are reporting 567 deaths in the state. There have been more than 10,700 confirmed cases. And in Washington, more than 124,000 people have been tested. The state of Oregon placed strict new restrictions on a Portland nursing home. It has been a hot spot for COVID-19 with at least 14 deaths. Today, investigators released their findings. Kylie Boshi takes a look. Healthcare at Foster Creek, a nursing home in southeast Portland, is now the site of the largest known cluster of coronavirus cases and deaths in the state, with 50 confirmed cases among residents and staff. At least 14 people have died say state health officials. In a scathing report, 
The State Department of Human Services found that residents of health care at Foster Creek were at risk of immediate jeopardy. State inspectors found serious violations in the nursing home, including staff that didn't always wash their hands, didn't have proper protective masks and gowns, and failed to have proper COVID-19 training to help control the spread of infection. When DHS was asked if lives could have been saved. That's a very difficult question to answer, naturally, because we are hypothesizing here. What I can share with you all is that uh, as soon as uh, we became aware that there is a condition and there is a situation in um, healthcare at Foster Creek, we began taking action. As a result of the state's findings, healthcare at Foster Creek is facing strict new restrictions, including no new residents, no visitors, and restricted activities, including no more communal dining. The state will provide extra staff at the Southeast Portland Nursing Home and oversee infection control and assist with operations. Nursing homes are especially susceptible to outbreaks because residents live in close proximity and many already have pre-existing health conditions. There are currently 24 facilities that have COVID positive cases in Oregon. We're working with all of them. Not all of them are in crisis. This week, the state launched a multi-agency support team to help nursing homes and long-term care facilities which make up nearly half of Oregon's coronavirus deaths. Kyle Aboshi, KGW News. We reached out to healthcare at Foster Creek for a response, but didn't get a reply. Federal money to help small businesses has run out. The U.S. Small Business Administration said it's not accepting any new applications for the Paycheck Protection Program or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Lindsay Nadrich spoke to small business owners still waiting for help. The U.S. Small Business Administration processed 14 years worth of loans in less than 14 days, totaling more than $311 billion. But now they're not approving any new loans because the money has run out. SPA is now asking Congress to approve additional funds for the Paycheck Protection Program because there are still thousands of small businesses waiting for financial help. I try to remain optimistic about this, but it, it, I'm not going to lie, it's been been a challenge. Stephen Quick owns SQ Merchant Services in Tigard. His company helps businesses process payments. He applied for a small business loan, but is yet to get it and now worries he won't. Yep, got it submitted, you know, wait 24, 48 hours, and then I get the notification this morning on all of social media that they're out of money. So, you know, throws that one out the window. Andy Ricker, the chef and owner of Pock Pock, also applied for a small business loan the second he was able to, but still hasn't received it either, and says the process has been far from easy. And then we got an email later today saying, money's gone, uh, we're going to keep your application in line in the queue. So if funds do show up again, we'll keep the process going. Pock Pock had to close six restaurants and lay off 160 employees because of the COVID-19 closures. As for what the future of Pock Pock looks like, Andy can't say just yet. But I can say that without this money, um, it's almost certain that we will not come back whole. We will somehow Pock Pock will exist as a brand, but Will every single restaurant reopen doing the same thing we did before? I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how that's going to happen. SPA says it will be able to issue new loans when Congress approves additional funding. I'm Lindsay Nadrich, KGW News. And times are tough for a lot of people, no matter what industry they're in. I have a lot of numbers here for you, but these are really important ones. The Oregon Employment Department released new numbers today, showing 53,800 Oregonians filed for unemployment benefits last week. That brings the four-week state total to 296,800 Oregonians. In Washington, more than 143,000 people filed for unemployment last week, bringing the four-week state total to more than 585,000. And let's look at the national figures. 5.2 million Americans filed unemployment claims last week, bringing the total to 22 million in four weeks. This marks the worst stretch of U.S. job losses ever on record. At this point, one in every seven people in the workforce have lost their jobs. President Trump unveiled guidelines today to start reopening the U.S. economy. The plan includes three phases and gives governors the authority to make decisions about how their states move forward. 
There is no set timeline, but phase one of the plan can only begin once the state sees 14 straight days with a decrease in coronavirus cases. Governors are also encouraged to harmonize their reopening efforts with other states in their region. We know many people right now need help putting food on the table. Food banks are busier than ever. Tim Gordon takes us to one in Clark County that is rising up to the task of offering help. Battleground Washington has one of those all-American main streets. And just off Main Street is a small town example of how Americans are helping each other out. The North County Community Food Bank is getting food to twice as many new clients so far this year as at this time last year, helping up to 750 households a month. So it's an amazing rise. A number of families and individuals that have been laid off or their time have been, has been uh, reduced. Liz Surveney leads the food bank. Normally, they have clients come into the pantry and pick out their items. Right now, volunteers must pack it up and deliver curbside. Here we want them to know we've got all the time in the world. We'll listen to what's going on and help you in any way we can and get you the food supplies that we can give you. Many of the nonprofit senior volunteers can't work right now to protect their health. But some others who are furloughed or working less are here, like Camille Stevens. How does it feel to be doing it? Oh, it's fun. It's good. Everybody here is fantastic to work with, and I've really enjoyed the past couple weeks of volunteering here. What's happening in Battleground and at other food banks makes a difference. That means so much to me because, you know, I, I have a disabled wife, and it's really hard to care for her, and I try not to go out to grocery stores so much. There you go, sir. Day. Every day we should be giving from the heart and giving back and then our clients will feel that love and feel that caring and know that this is a safe place for them. Normally the North County Food Bank is meant specifically for people in need in North Clark County, but another change due to the COVID-19 crisis is at this point it's really here for anybody who needs some help. Another sign we're all in this together. In Battleground, Tim Gordon, KGW News. Still ahead here at 5 o'clock, schools may be closed, but yearbook editors aren't missing their deadlines. We'll show you how they're getting creative to complete this year's editions. And I'm Matt Safino. Warm today, even warmer tomorrow. And are you wondering about the rain? I'll let you know when it'll be back and how much we may see.